Hey, Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure. Chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Hey! Abbott! Well, it's about time you got here. Where were you? Well, I was over my Uncle Mike's house, Abbott, and is he busy? He's got to eat biscuits for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, what's the idea? A biscuit company is running a slogan contest, and Aunt May has to send in a thousand box tops. Well, what does Uncle Mike uh, think of the idea? He told Aunt May to mail in the biscuits. He'd rather eat the box tops. Uh, <laughs> 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 How did Aunt May ever meet Uncle Mike anyhow, Lou? The first time they met, it was at the country club, and they spent the first date in the country. And the next time they met, it was at a swimming club, and then they went swimming. And after that, they got married, and they went to another club that influenced their lives. Uh, what club was that? The store club. The... <laughs> well, they're quite a couple. Oh, yes. Uncle Mike says he has only been, only been two times in his life that he didn't understand Aunt May. When was that? Before they were married and after. <laughs> Oh, you should get married, Costello, and quit running around. Every night you wind up with a different girl. You're right, Abbott, and I'm tired of winding up. I want to start pitching. <laughs> How are you going to... Go ahead, we give you time. <laughs> How are you getting along with your new girl, Lou? Oh, how am I getting along with my new girl? Hmm, hmm. She's got me eating out of her hand. She has? Next week, she's going to buy me a dish. <laughs> but I don't think I want to marry her anyway, Abbott. She wears very expensive clothes. Oh, now, wait a minute. How do you know her clothes are expensive? Every time I go over to her house, there's a guy in the closet guarding them. Oh, get him out of here. Get him out. Now, before we get back to the laugh department, let's listen to what this fella has to say. What are you doing with that rubber doll? Huh? What are you doing with that rubber doll? It's a present for my sister's baby, Tony. He's one year old today. Uh, has the baby learned to walk yet? Abbott, the kid is only one year old. He only learned how to drive the car last week. What? <laughs> what's, what's the baby's name? It's my sister's fifth baby, and she named it Ming Toy Lotus Blossom. Ming Toy Lotus Blossom? Mm. Why did she name the child that? She read in a big book that every fifth child born is a Chinese. I... <laughs> Never mind that, Lou. Uh, what is your sister's husband doing now? Oh, what's he doing now? He yeah. had a little filling station. And what a filling station. But they picketed him and closed him up. Now he's opened a skunk farm. A skunk farm? Mm-hmm. A skunk farm? He figures that's one business the union won't stick their nose in. <laughs> You know, I haven't seen your brother-in-law in a long time. How, how is he, Lou? Ah, uh, you wouldn't know him, Abbott. The no. sands of time have changed his face. Well, he's only a young guy. How could the sands of time change his face, Costello? My sister belted him in a puss with an hourglass. <laughs> 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 
Where are your sister and husband you living now? Now has granulated eyelids. Yes. <laughs> Lou, <laughs> where are your sister and husband living now? I'll let you know in a second here. <laughs> in the middle of the page. A <laughs> minute. They're living in Pasadena, and boy, is that a ritzy town. Oh, no, no, no. It's not so ritzy. Yeah, but Pasadena is so high class that they stop all the tourists at the city limit and make them rent mink coats before they can drive through town. No, I don't believe it. I know it, I know it. Ah, stop. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Huh? I don't believe it. You don't believe it? No, I don't. My brother Pat used to drive a truck for the city of Pasadena. He told me that all the garbage he picked up was gift wrapped. Oh. <laughs> You mean your brother Pat drives a garbage truck? Oh, he's just doing that until he gets his new invention on the market. His invention will change the whole toothbrush industry. What is it? A tooth on a stick to clean brushes. <laughs> Costello, let's face it. Your brother is nothing but a bum. Abbott, that's why I can't sleep at night. Thinking what a bum my brother Pat is. Well, if you can't sleep, why didn't you count sheep? I did. Once I counted to 10,000 sheep. I was just ready to fall asleep when along came a black sheep, and I got to think of what a bum my brother Pat is, and I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. <laughs> Miss Costello, here's that bicycle that you ordered. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. What's the idea of buying a bicycle, Costello? I didn't want to tell you, Abbott. Wasting your money like that, buying a bicycle. I insist that you tell me what you're going to do with it now. Oh, well, if you must know. I must know. I'll tell you. Well, tell me. Last night I dreamed I was chasing Rita Hayworth and I couldn't catch her. Tonight, I'm taking a bicycle to bed with me. <laughs> and if that don't get her, tomorrow night, a motor goes on it. Costello, with all the thousands of people that have no place to live and are looking for vacancies, how can you walk around with a big empty head like that? Show me in the script where it says anything like that. Oh, wait a minute. I can tell a joke. I'm a pretty good showman. Yeah? Yeah. You tell a joke like P.T. Barnum. P.T. Barnum is dead. You keep telling those kind of jokes, you'll join them. I... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that, Lou. My wife always laughs at my jokes. Did you ever notice those little uh, crow's feet around her eyes? Those are from laughing at my jokes. If those are crow's feet around your wife's eyes, uh -huh. the crows that made them must have been wearing baseball shoes. I, uh, <laughs> how can you say that? My wife, Betty, has a beautiful face. She's got an automobile face. Well, what's an automobile face? As soon as she gets the jack, she ought to have it lifted. I, <laughs> my, my wife is okay. And you'd better be off if you found a nice home. Well, you'd be much better off, Lou, if you found a nice home uh, with a loving girl and got Do married yourself. Do you know yourself. where you're at? No. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but my wife is okay. You'd be better off if you found a nice home, loving girl. I'm and got lost married myself now. <laughs> I found it. I All found right, it. I found mine. <laughs> Have you got your place? Have you got yours? Oh, yes. Let's go. Let's go from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is okay. You'd be better off if you found a nice, home-loving girl and got married yourself. Well, we gave you enough time to rehearse yeah, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I had a home-loving girl, and I had to get rid of her. Why? When I wasn't around, she was home-loving some other guy. <laughs> well, you should go out more and meet some nice girls. I'm Lou. going out tonight. There's going to be 26 girls at this party. I'm going to kiss every one of them. Now, that's the trouble with you. You have no manners. Now, when there are 26 girls at a party and you take, you talk about kissing, every one of them, remember, one dozen. One dozen? No. Well, tell me which one it is and I'll cross her off my list. <laughs> Did you get it? No, I didn't get it. <laughs> they are lost where we were before. <laughs> Costello, you should be satisfied with one girl. Don't you know one girl that you like better than the rest? Oh, yeah, but I saw one a day that I could really go for. Well, why don't you propose to her? Propose to her? Yeah. How dare you say that to me? Well, your father proposed to your mother. Yes, she was my mother, but this girl is a total stranger. I... <laughs> well, why don't you start courting her? I did. I sent her some uh, orchards. Not orchards. 
<laughs> it says here, orchard. No, 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 not orchards. Orchids. Kids, orchards. kids, kids. Oh, sure. Probably after we're married. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, you dummy. You don't, you don't get the girl with orchids. You get her with orchids. Kids, kids, kids. Just a minute. Where am I getting all these kids? I ain't even married yet. <laughs> you talk sense. I'm talking about orchids. Orchids are uh, raised in a nursery. Your kids might have been raised in a nursery, but our kids are going to be raised at home. No, no. <laughs> you don't understand. I'm talking about orchids. We have orchids at home. They're potted. They take after you, don't they? <laughs> Hey, look, Where did this come uh, from, kid? <laughs> it's our beautiful new secretary, Viola Vaughn. Boy, I'm glad you showed up early, Viola. Tonight I'm going to sing a song just for you. Why, Costello, I didn't know you sang. Oh, I got a high voice. I can hit a high you above T. High you? Fine, thanks. High you. <laughs> Pay no attention to him, Viola. Pay no attention to him. Uh, why don't you and I have a bite of supper after the show, huh? Well, I... Just a minute, I... Viola. I hired you. Don't you think you should go out with me, kid? Please, Mr. Costello. I'll decide who I want to go out with. Well, that suits me. Make your own choice. I won't try to help you in any shape or form. <laughs> with, your... <laughs> with your shape... With your shape and form, nothing will help you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, that was awfully clever, Abbott. Oh, yeah. You know, Viola Abbott is practicing up for television. Well, why would Mr. Abbott want to be on television? It's the only way he can get in every bar in town at once. I... <laughs> well, Abbott, I, uh, and I, I think we both struck out. Now you tell one, uh, Viola. <laughs> I guess I'll have a try at it. Uh, did, did you... <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was too good to last. <laughs> well, I'll have a try at it. Did you boys know that my uncle is in the hospital? Uh, no, Viola. Tell us what happened. My uncle was watching two men hoisting a piano into the fifth floor window of a hotel. He was standing underneath them yelling, heave ho, heave ho. But wait a minute now. How, how did he get into the hospital? They thought he said, leave go. <laughs> Let's give this kid six silver dollars and a box of Snickers. <laughs> uh, quiet, cousin. I think Viola has a terrific sense of humor. Oh, uh, thank you, bud. I have another funny story. I went to the racetrack yesterday and bet on a horse that was a hundred to one. A hundred to one? That's terrific odds. Did the horse win? No. He was leading the field by ten lengths when suddenly he jumped the rail and ran to the grandstand. What for? When he saw those terrific odds, he ran to the two-dollar window and put a bet on himself. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have just listened to a joke by three unemployed people. Uh <laughs> Three unemployed yeah, people. Yeah, you, Viola, and the guy that wrote the stuff. <laughs> and that's the halfway mark in tonight's laugh race. Time for an intermission to concentrate on this.
Before we go back to work tonight, let's hear from our blonde cutie pie, little, little bitsy Virginia Maxie. The guy that invented the Costello hidden ball trick. Well, did your hidden ball uh, trick uh, work good? Good? Mm -hmm. That was 20 years ago. Nobody's found the ball yet. <laughs> well, you don't look like no football player to me. Football players have to be rugged and powerful and, uh, and strong. Yeah, but, uh, but when I played football <clears throat> at Colt Hill in Patterson, New Jersey, I was powerful. All those kids were rugged. Very rugged. <laughs> I can't say rugged. <laughs> I just said you it. You just said it. <laughs> have no showers. By the end of the season, everybody said we were the strongest team in New Jersey. <laughs> With the wind at our backs, nobody could beat us. Uh, that must have been some football team. I remember our last game, Abbott. I was calling the signals. Mildred, Maine, 6664. Gladys, Hollywood, 7953. Betty, Walnut, 3841. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Some well, <laughs> yeah, but what was, what was the idea of using girls' uh, phone numbers as signals? Strategy. While the other team was writing them down, we scored 46 points. <laughs> Telegram for Luke Costello. Telegram for Luke Costello. Yeah, boy, I'll take it. Hey, you have it. What? It's one of my Sam Shovel Detective fans. Boy, am I getting popular as Sam Shovel Detective. Well, read it. All right. It says, Dear Lou Costello, I never miss your program. I really enjoy your portrayal of Sam Shovel, private detective. Your acting was so thrilling, my hair stood on end. I'm coming over to see you tonight. Mr. Costello, there's someone here to see you. Show the man in. It's no man, just a few hairs standing on end. <laughs> well, Costello, Sam Shovel, you're really killing the people. What case have you chosen for your Sam Shovel story tonight? Well, it's a case I worked on in the Sahara Desert. I call it The Two Dirty Beto Winds. Or it's time to change the sheiks. <laughs> well, that's an, old, that's an old case, Costello. Haven't you got one more up to date? Well, my latest case. I call it the case of the telephone operator who died dancing, or sorry, wrong rumba. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's go on with the case. Yes, I'm Sam Shovel, private detective. It's been a slow day with the detective business. I'm sitting here in my little office listening to my favorite radio program. Calling Dr. Brand, surgery. Calling Dr. Brand, surgery. Calling George Jordan, girl intern. They never can find those two. <laughs> There's more going on in that hospital than just operations. <laughs> I turn off the radio, I listen to the wind howling on the outside. Partner? You all partner? It's a southwestern wind. <laughs> I decided to check up on some of my latest cases. Here's the one of the baby that was gypped. When I found him, he was wearing half a diaper. Somebody had shortchanged him. <laughs> I think I'll relax. I feel like a smoke. <laughs> that reminds me I read in the paper this morning where most of the doctors who switched to camels are now back driving automobiles. <laughs> Gaze out the window in the office across the street, I see Mamie, the stenographer. What a girl. I took her to dinner last night. She eats like a bird. She always orders worms. <laughs> it's about time for my pal, Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad, to show up. Last week, when the Red Cross asked for blood donors, Lieutenant Abbott was the first to volunteer. He gave his blood the hard way. The hard way. He cut his throat. <laughs> Every time I think of Lieutenant Abbott, I think of his bow-legged wife. Brother, is she bow-legged? When Mrs. Abbott sits around the house, she really sits around the house. <laughs> Hello, Sam Shovel. Mm. I've come over to tell you that Martin, the murderous midget, is on the loose again. Martin, the murderous midget, the toughest midget in the world, known to the police as public enemy number one half. <laughs> yes, Sam, and if I catch up with Martin, the midget... It's goodbye to his racket. Lieutenant Abbott ain't kidding. He's a great racket buster. He's busted 15 rackets already this year, and if he don't stop busting them at the Beverly Hills Tennis Club, they won't let him play there anymore. <laughs> Sam, I got troubles with my owner. I'm thinking of divorcing my wife. Last night I decided I, I can't stand her cooking. 
Lieutenant Abbott, you've been married to that woman for 30 years. How come you just decided you can't stand her cooking? Until last night. We always ate out. <laughs> However, let's forget my problems. I will. Let's forget it and parley and forget your jokes, too. Sam, <laughs> how's the detective business going? Any new cases? Yes, I'm on the trail of a woman criminal. Show off Susie. If I catch her, she'll go to the chair. I can't stand that dame. She's always showing off. Last week, she started bragging again. She wanted to show everybody that her husband has brains. You can't arrest a woman for showing that her husband had brains? By shooting the top of his head off? <laughs> Forget about show off, Susie, Sam. You're in, you're in for some real trouble. Dora the Dip escaped from prison this morning. Dora the Dip, mm -hmm. the most beautiful woman criminal I ever met. What a temper she had. The first time I saw her, she was beating her second husband over the head. She kept beating her second husband over the head. What was she beating him with? Her first husband. <laughs> Dora the Dip, she was mad about me. It was on account that she threw her second husband over. All I had to say was, Dora, I want to see you tonight. No matter what man she was with, she'd throw him over. On account of that, they put her in jail. Oh, wait a minute. You can't put a woman in jail for throwing men over? Over the Pasadena Bridge? <laughs> Sam, I heard that Dora was arrested while working as a clerk in a department store. She was jailed for taking money out of the cash register. That's a lie, Lieutenant. She never took any money out of the cash register. I'm glad to hear that. She never family. put any money in the cash register. <laughs> Aha! There you are, Sam Shovel. It was Dora the Dip, and she looked more beautiful than ever. Sam? Yes? I'm going to kill you. I don't know. She's only bluffing, Sam. <laughs> you sent me to prison. You took me away from my family. Yeah. My five children by my first husband. Yeah. My seven children by my second husband. She's still bluffing you, Sam. She may be bluffing, but it sounds to me like she's got a full house. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, on account of you, I spent ten years in prison. Ten years locked up with a thousand women. Do you know what it means to be alone for ten years with a thousand women? <laughs> no, but I'd give anything to find out. must have been terrible in prison, Dora. Lieutenant Abbott, you don't know what I went through. All day long, I had to pose with my twin sister for pictures for prison magazine ads. What did the ad say? Which twin has the crime wave? <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm free, Sam Shovel, and I'm going to make you suffer as I've suffered. Sam? Yes? Part of me died in that prison. Don't worry, Dora. With what you got left, you can do plenty of living. <laughs> Dora, you haven't changed a bit. I thought prison would straighten you out. If they straighten her out, she could sue them for every cent they got. <laughs> Sam Shovel, in spite of what you did to me, I'm still mad about you. You are? Yes, yeah, Sam. You're different from any man I ever met. Now you tell me the same. Okay. You're different from any man I've ever met. <laughs> You sent me to prison and made a monkey out of me. Now I'm going to get even. I'm going to give you a kiss that'll make a monkey out of you. Come here. Uh, <laughs> Sam. Sam Shovel, speak to me. Where are you, Sam? Up on a chandelier. Don't stand there. Toss me a banana and a bag of peanuts. <laughs> There's a curtain call coming up, folks. But first, you'll be interested in hearing this.
Well, Costello, you sure worked hard tonight. Yep, but you know my motto. Hard work never hurt anybody. That's what I keep telling the people that do my work. Well, you should thank... <laughs> you should thank the people that do your work. I'm going to do that right now, Abbott. That's First, what? I want to thank our writing staff, headed by Eddie Foreman, with Paul Conlon, Pat Costello, Martin Ragaway, and Len Stern. Wait a minute. And our band leader, Matty Malnick. You're right. And let's not forget our producer, Charles Vander. See you next Thursday night, folks. Good night, folks. Good night to everybody in Patterson. Good night. Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show, produced and transcribed in Hollywood. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station. Enjoying the timeless classics on Golden Age Radio? If you're loving the nostalgia and captivating stories, consider supporting our channel with a tip. Your generosity helps us continue bringing you the best of vintage radio entertainment. Simply click on the link in the description. Thank you for being part of our community. Lost in Brazil invites you on an unforgettable journey where every moment is an adventure waiting to be discovered. Join us as we uncover the soul of Brazil, one incredible experience at a time. Click on the link in the description and embark on the ultimate Brazilian odyssey. You have been listening to Golden Age Radio, rumble.com slash C slash G-A-R, brought to you by G3PL.com. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Old Time Radio Research Group for their remarkable efforts in preserving and archiving the captivating world of old time radio programs. Their dedication to safeguarding these precious audio gems ensures that future generations can relish the enchanting stories, music, and entertainment of the past. Their invaluable contribution allows us to step back in time and experience the magic of radio history firsthand. Their link is in the description below.